Scott. I'm the Executive Director for SCAT, the Community Development Advocates of Detroit. It is my honor to be here today. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about why we're here today, about why the coalition exists and what you can expect from today's forum. First, I want to acknowledge all the coalition members. Feel free to stand or wave your hand. But the coalition members, Detroit People's Platform, Detroit Action Commonwealth, Detroit Eviction Defense, Michigan People's Defense Network, thank you back there, Michigan Legal Services, National Conference of Black Lawyers, Moratorium Now, Community Development Advocates of Detroit, Street Democracy, United Community Housing Coalition, We the People of Detroit. Thank you all for your hard work and for making this a reality. So we all know, despite the stories, that this work that this form is very needed. So I was reflecting this morning on how to greet you, how to prepare you for what we're going to do today. And I have to say that for a minute, I was at a loss for words, which is rare for me. I had had to speak professionally for 20 years. But I, I couldn't really think of what I wanted to say. And I think it's because there's just so much. There's so much happening. You know, I woke up reflecting on the injustice of the decision of Brother Philando Castile's murder. Yes. Yeah. And sure. I want to send again my prayers and my thoughts to his family and to all of us. Because I looked at my own beautiful black husband, thought about my father, and what it says about what this country is doing to us. Yes, sure. um, You know, I'm coming here to talk about the thousands, thousands of foreclosures that have happened and continue to happen in our city. While at the same time, our elected officials give millions, and that's again, millions in yep. public dollars, yep. tax subsidies to developers, yep. Yep. and actively work to prevent community benefits that would give anything to impact the neighborhoods. So to think of all of that, you know, I was really struck with like, what the hell? What is going on here? That's right. That's right. And so again, I want to thank you for being here, for being committed to fight, to educate others. And we have, you know, some of the baddest activists in this room today. It is only, you know, seeing the work that they do that keeps me going in this work. I'm a Detroiter. I'm the kind of Detroiter that you can't say nothing to me about Detroit. Because I feel like I am Detroit. And so I am sick of this two cities narrative. Yeah. Um, this neighborhoods and downtown, you know, I refuse to accept that this is how it's going to be and that Detroit cannot be for a Detroiter. I just refuse to accept that. And so today, the coalition, you know, together, and under the leadership of the brilliant fighter, Professor Bernadette here, you will hear from later, you know, she's provided some research and scholarship on this issue. And so we know, if you're in Detroit, we know about foreclosures. What we may not know as much about is property tax assessments. And so for years, Detroit has assessed property in violation of our state constitution. And so using these incorrect and unconstitutional assessments to set the taxes that we have to pay. And then when people can't pay them, taking their homes through foreclosure. So again, you know, you have to stop and pause sometimes to really get the gravity of something. Let that sink in. They have you know, incorrectly assessed us, use this incorrect data to then take people's homes. And I don't have to tell you how devastating foreclosure is and the resulting impact it's having on all of our families. The coalition has come together to develop a strategy to end these illegal assessments and 
develop compensation options for those who have lost their homes. So today what we're going to do, we're going to hear from other dynamic speakers on the issue and some of the other work that's occurring around this issue. After that, we are going to break into groups because we need to hear from you. You know, we need to know what you want, what compensation makes sense for you. So in these discussion groups, we're going to start off with some options around compensation. We're going to end by identifying the top options that you select. And lastly, you'll receive information about the coalition's next action on July 8th. So again, thank you for being here. Thank you for all the work that you do. Thank you for getting up every morning. Because I do believe, I have to believe, that together and solidarity, we will win. Thank you, Serena. Uh, my name is Amina Cook, and I'll be a facilitator today. Um, next up, we have Monica Lewis Patrick. Monica is known as the Water Warrior. She's an educator, entrepreneur, and human rights activist and advocate. She's the co-founder and president and CEO of We the People of Detroit, and that organization fights for access to clean water for Detroiters, even if they can't afford to pay those water bills. We the People works to bring clean water education on water issues, and they conduct research to raise awareness and mobilize people to take action regarding water access in Detroit. Monica is actively engaged in almost every struggle on behalf of Detroit residents. She's a member of the, water, the People's Water Board Coalition, the Human Rights Network, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, and she was named to the World Water Justice Coalition, which is the world's largest water event, in 2015. Monica attended the historic Bennett College. She's a graduate of East Tennessee State University, and she has a bachelor's degree in social work and sociology, and a master of arts in liberal studies, with a concentration in criminal justice, sociology, and public management. She's currently one of the leaders at the forefront of the water rights struggle in Detroit. So we welcome Monica Lewis Patrick. Yeah. Wow, thank you so much, Serena. Uh, as a fellow Detroitan, it definitely just sticks in my craw. And for those that don't know that phrase, that's a Southern phrase. <laughs> because I'm originally from a place called Northeast Tennessee, Kingsport, Tennessee. Uh, my family moved to Detroit in 1952. My great-great-grandparents moved here. They were uh, actually fleeing what was happening with coal mines in West Virginia. And so I consider myself a granddaughter of Detroit. So I'm like to read it. You want to pick a fight? Yeah. <laughs> Say something about Detroit. Mm -hmm. You want to get me started? Mm -hmm. Talk about the people of Detroit. But I have the dubious honor of being able to uh, attempt to connect the dots for you. And we have a saying with we the people of Detroit, it's not our fault, but it sure is our fight. And so what I wanted to do for many of you that have come to address the issue of foreclosures this morning is help you connect the dots. Because if you're facing foreclosure, guess what? It's not your fault. But I'm here to tell you it better be your fight. What we know about foreclosures in the city of Detroit is that it is connected to every movement issue that is happening in this city that foreclosures are not happening because you didn't pay your fair share, you didn't want to pay your mortgage, you didn't go to work, you didn't invest in the city, and you didn't pay your taxes. What has happened is that there has been a highly orchestrated plan of evil that's been imposed on you. And it's been happening for decades. When you look at water rates in the city of Detroit, your water has gone up for the last 10 years over 120%. That is one of the instruments that they're using to force you out of your homes. What we know about water, if you don't have running water in your house for 72 hours or more, you're in jeopardy of losing your children. You're also in jeopardy of them using eminent domain to seize your property. What we also know in the city of Detroit oh, uh, since uh, the last 17 years is that we've been instrumental in continuing to tax ourselves to provide quality education to our children. Well, what has happened in this city is they have actually seized your schools, given them away for a dollar to nonprofits while you're still paying for over $1.5 uh, $1 billion in taxes. 
You have on top of that the fact that pensioners, which were the most secure tax-paying members of this city, actually having to pay for a contrived bankruptcy. Over 80% of that bankruptcy was on the backs of the pensioners. What we know is that the state of Michigan owes the city of Detroit over $2 billion in unpaid taxes and fees, but they haven't been forced to pay their fair share. This is why many of you have been forced into foreclosure. The other thing you need to know is that many of the banks that benefited from the contrived bankruptcy are also the same banks that are buying up the aquifers and the water systems around the globe. What you also need to know is it's not in your mind, it's not in your head, you are not a conspiracy theorist. These are facts. The DeVos family has been a major part of ushering in policies just targeting the people of Detroit. You also need to know that the DeVos family is connected to a company called Veolia. Veolia is the same company that has been advising the city of Detroit to privatize the internal operations of the water department to privatize public education, to invest in the M1 rail, which is the trolley to nowhere, <laughs> to be able to take your money as pensioners, people that have paid and stayed and done more than anybody could ever expect. You are paying to subsidize millionaires and billionaires to have playgrounds downtown. Yeah. So I'm telling you once again, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. But today I'm hoping that it'll be the beginning of us winning together this fight. Mayor Young said, if you find a good fight, get in it. This housing fight is that fight. Thank you. Yeah. Next, we're going to hear from Sonia Bonnet. She's a Detroit resident who has fought foreclosure and has personal experience with it. She's going to share some information about what it is to be a Detroiter who's dealt with this process. Poverty 
exemption program, but nobody told us that. So every day, again, we woke up with that looming over us. How are we gonna do this? Any day now, there could be a note stuck to the door or that big garbage can in our driveway to move our stuff out. And then along came this wonderful lady named Bernadette who said, you know what, we got this fight going on and we're trying to help the people that were illegally foreclosed on or facing illegal foreclosure. And I said, I'll fight with you. And today, today we're asking, I'm asking, that you all fight with us. Because if you do, you can keep your home in order. Even if you lost it already, you can get some type of compensation. It's not going to happen today. It's not going to happen tomorrow. You're going to get information today. You're going to get fed mentally today on how to fight for your home, for your neighborhoods, for your schools. So it's not going to happen right away. But if you stick with us and you fight with us, we will get it done. I'm here to stay because I'm a Detroiter. I don't have any intention on leaving. They're not moving me out. That's right. I don't know about you, but I'm not here. So all I'm asking the closing is that you stay with us, you follow the coalition, come out on the 8th of July. Let's fight. Okay. Let's fight to keep our homes and our neighborhoods. Thank you. Next, we have Bunsi Tukitaba. She's a staff attorney at the ACLU of Michigan. She's responsible for developing and litigating cutting-edge, high-impact cases on a wide variety of civil liberty issues, and as well as engaging in non-litigation advocacy and outreach. Bunsi Tukitaba has a law degree from Wayne State University Law School and a bachelor's degree from the University of Toronto. crisis more severe than we've seen since the Great Depression. In the past several years, we've all watched as Wayne County has foreclosed on home after home and kicked out thousands of Detroiters for failure to pay back taxes that they never should have been responsible for in the first place. The key issue here is that in 2008, when we saw the housing crisis come before us and the market crashed, housing prices were depressed, we did not see a corresponding reduction in tax assessments to match those plummeting values. Additionally, according to state law, homeowners in Michigan whose incomes fall below the federal poverty guidelines or even slightly above those poverty guidelines, are entitled to what's called a poverty tax exemption. This, in essence, means that their tax liability should be zero or 50%. But, as we know, the city of Detroit is not as transparent or as efficient as many other cities in, in Michigan. So what they actually did was that they didn't advertise they didn't tell anyone about the poverty tax exemption, and they actually made it the process even more convoluted and difficult for people to navigate so that thousands of homeowners who are actually eligible for a poverty exemption never even knew about it, and if they did know about it, couldn't even access it. So, thousands of homeowners today are at risk of losing their homes for taxes that they never should have been responsible or required to pay in the first place. These policies have had a gross disparate impact on African Americans in the city of Detroit, who are 10 times more likely to lose their homes to foreclosure than white Michiganders. So, the ACLU, my organization, decided to do something about it. In July 2016, the ACLU partnered with the NAACP and the law firm of Covington and Burling to file a lawsuit against Wayne County and the city of Detroit. We have two claims here, once against the county, once against the city. The county's claim 
argues that the system of over-assessments of poverty of, uh, of taxes has had a gross disparate racial impact on Detroiters, and this is a violation of the Federal Fair Housing Act. On the other hand, the claim against the city of Detroit is arguing that under the Constitution, everyone is entitled to due process, a fair process to retrieve rights that are guaranteed to them by the law. And we're arguing that the poverty tax exemption process is so convoluted and so burdensome to the Detroiters that they are being deprived of the process under the law. We argued so once we started digging in to the process and the poverty tax exemption uh, system, we found both astonishing results, but that were typical across the board. For example, take one of our main plaintiffs, Walter Hicks. In 2014, 57-year-old Walter, who is a disabled Detroiter homeowner who lives off approximately $15,000 a year in Social Security benefits went to the city municipal building to apply for a poverty exemption. $15,000, he lives alone, he makes below the federal poverty guidelines. So he would be, as all of us know now, entitled to a poverty exemption. The appraisal for his home, who, it's an independent appraisal was done on his home, which valued it at around $9,000. But when he got his tax bill every year, it was valued at over $40,000. As a result of the $31,000 over assessment, Walter's tax bill is stood at more than $1,600 per year. Walter doesn't have his own mode of transportation. He took buses, asked for rides, borrowed cars to keep going down to the city county building to endure the 30 to an hour minute you know, wait to talk to someone about the poverty exemption. Once he actually got to the front of the line, he was told, all right, fill out this application. We'll send you an application for the poverty exemption. Two months later, he was notified that his, his application was denied. The city claimed, and, and get this, the city claimed that Walter actually owned another property in the city of Detroit. Actually, that property was in the name of someone named Walter Hicks, but had a different middle name. So even when the city discovered their mistake, even after Walter paid for the deed of that other house to prove that he didn't own it, the city continued to deny his 2014 application. He was hit with a foreclosure notice because he was unable to pay the overinflated property taxes that he was never entitled to, you know, never required to pay in the first place. He was embarrassed, but he was shocked to see and walk out of his front door and see that almost every other house on his block had the same foreclosure notice. The failures in the poverty exemption process and the over-assessment of property taxes are rampant. We see eligible and qualified property owners fall through the cracks every single day. And it's, based, it, it's because our city government is incompetent. <clears throat> Wayne County's tax foreclosures have had the most severe impact on black communities. And it echoes a history of housing discrimination that blacks in the city have been subject to for at least a century. Our case seeks two things. A final order halting all foreclosures and sales of owner-occupied homes in the city until the city and the county does proper tax assessments based on the Constitution. And second, an order requiring the city of Detroit to implement a constitutional and fair process for the poverty tax exemptions and allow Detroiters to go back to 2014 and apply for a poverty exemption in that, from that time where the process was unfair. 
Currently, we are litigating the case. The fair housing claim against the county is being appealed um, because the lower court kicked it out. Um, on the against the city of Detroit, our claim we're coming to the table. They've came, they've come to the table and agreed to negotiate a resolution to that. There are many issues brought with that, but hopefully we can, or they can come to us with uh, relief that many Detroit homeowners need. So what does this mean for you? How can you fight back? How can you help us? How can we help you? One, spread awareness about the availability of the poverty exemption. It's available for anyone whose income falls below or is slightly above the poverty guidelines. The application is available online now, and despite what they say, you have until the first week of December to compile your documents and submit it to the city. Second, if you hear that someone's in trouble, lend them a hand. Let them know that there are resources out there for them, like UCHC, um, like our lawsuit. And if we succeed in our lawsuit, Many of you in this room today and several Detroiters are entitled to relief. One, relief for uh, having proper tax assessments, and two, you might have the opportunity to go back to 2014 to 2016 and apply for a poverty exemption. So potentially you can get a discharge of what you owe today. But that's only if they agree to the relief that we're seeking or the judge grants it. Third and last, we need to hold our elected officials accountable. We elected them. They are responsible for implementing these protections that are guaranteed to us under the law. We need to know our rights, we need to be informed, and we need to tell them and hold them accountable. Thank you very much for having me. Our final speaker is Bernadette Atuahine. Bernadette has a JD from Yale Law School, an MPA from Harvard University Kennedy School, and a BA from UCLA. She was a graduate in Magna Cum Law. She, Professor Atuahine has a varied experience in the fields of law and international development. During law school, she worked as a legal consultant for the World Bank and as a human rights investigator for the Center of Economic and Social Rights. There, she received an Amnesty International Patrick Stewart Human Rights Award for her work with human rights organizations throughout South America. Professor Atuhene has served as a judicial clerk, at, judicial clerk at the Constitutional Court of South Africa as a Fulbright Scholar. There, she worked with Justices Mandala and Novo. She then practiced as an associate at Clearly Gottlieb Steen in Hamilton in New York, where she focused on sovereign date and real estate transactions. Professor Tuahine is a professor at IIT Chicago Ken, where she teaches law, policy, and international development, property, trust and estates, and international business transactions. She's also a research professor at the American Bar Foundation. She's been awarded the Council on Foreign Relations International Affairs Fellowship and worked with the South African Director General of Land Affairs and his staff. Her most recent book is titled, We Want What's Ours, the Learning from South Africa's Land Restitution Program. Professor Julianne has been awarded the Law and Public Affairs Fellowship at Princeton University and the National Science Foundation grant for her new book project about squatting in Detroit. Please help me welcome. Welcome, Professor. Good afternoon, everybody. I am so excited to be here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do this presentation in two parts. So the goal, my goal is by the time I leave this podium, every single individual in this room is going to understand what I mean when I say unconstitutional property tax assessments. That's my goal. And I'm proceeding in two parts. The first part is we uh, are our nonprofit, which is called Documentaries to Inspire Social Change, created a three minute short video in the simplest terms it explains what this thing, what the issues are uh, in terms of these uh, unconstitutional property tax assessments. So I'm going to start by playing that short three-minute video. And then after that, I'm going to get a little more complicated. I'm going to actually show you the data from the study that we actually did on unconstitutional assessments. So the point is, if it gets a little too complicated for you with all the numbers that I'm about to review, don't worry, because if you get this video, then you get the big picture. All right? So let's first start with the video. 
2015. The Wayne County Treasurer foreclosed upon approximately one in four Detroit properties for non-payment of property taxes. Once the properties were foreclosed, many were left vacant. Many were vandalized and stripped of everything of value. These derelict properties lowered property values and caused anyone who could get out to flee. The property tax foreclosure crisis in Detroit has wiped out entire neighborhoods of Detroit's most vulnerable residents. Poor and working class black families have borne the brunt of this crisis. And it should not have happened. According to the Michigan Constitution, no property should be assessed at more than 50% of its market value. It turns out, the city government systematically inflated the property tax assessments of homes in Detroit beyond this legal limit. In fact, between 2009 and 2015, 55 to 85% of Detroit properties were unconstitutionally assessed each year. This led to illegally inflated taxes on those properties. Why? Because in 2008, home values in Detroit plummeted as a result of the Great Recession. But instead of reducing property tax assessments to match the lower value of homes, the government robotically copied the previous rates, making only minor adjustments. It was no surprise that residents weren't able to pay. And here's the kicker. Many families were not supposed to be paying property taxes in the first place because they qualified for the Michigan poverty tax exemption. <laughs> but Detroit didn't publicize this and made the application process so difficult that it was nearly impossible to complete. So when we look at the decimation that unconstitutional property tax assessments have left behind, who is the blame? Working in poor people who are struggling to provide a home for their families? Or the government, who systematically and illegally inflated the assessed values of homes to increase their property tax revenue, then seized homes from families when they could not afford to pay? Join our fight to end unconstitutional tax foreclosures in Detroit. All right, in the most simple terms, that video just lays out for you what we're talking about when we talk about unconstitutional assessments. Now I'm just going to give you another layer of information to make this thing more real. So first, in between 2011 and 2015, we, in Detroit, there were one in four properties were subject to property tax foreclosure. One in four. We have not seen this number of property tax foreclosures in American history since the Great Depression. Unprecedented. So the real question is, well, what in the hell is going on here in Detroit? Why in the world are there this record number of property tax foreclosures. And when we talk about property tax foreclosure, I want, because the mortgage foreclosure hit Detroit as well, but I'm, this one in four is just property tax foreclosure. So what in the world is going on? When I, so in the study I'm doing, part of it I had to interview various government officials, and, and Dave Shemansky, who was the former Wayne County Deputy Treasurer, he's one of the people I interviewed, and I asked him what was going on, he told me, that you know, when people have a choice between paying their taxes and buying a purse, they decided to buy the purse, right? And these are the types of narratives that blame the poor that you hear over and over again from government officials, right? And this is nothing new. It's not just in the area of property tax assessments that we get these blaming the poor narratives. It's, it's, it's consistently in all kinds of areas. But what I want to do, what I'm trying to do with my study, is really get to the core of what's going on. And when you get to the core of what's going on, you find that it's not about blaming the poor and people buying purses. It's about structural injustice. Okay? And so what's actually happening is people in Detroit are being charged illegally high property taxes that, of course, they cannot afford to pay. And then their houses are being taken from them. And when I say illegal, I actually need to clean up my language because it's illegal to jaywalk. What's happening here is unconstitutional. That's right. One level above, all right? So what am I talking about? The Michigan State Constitution says that any pro no property should be assessed at more than 50% of its market value. 
right? And that state constitutional provision is backed up by, the, uh, uh, by a provision uh, 211.27A1 of the legislature, and it's backed up by case law. There's just legally, there's no doubt that properties are not to be assessed at more than 50% of its value. But I wanna just take, a, I wanna make sure everyone in the room understands what a property tax assessment are. So this is how your property tax is calculated. How your property tax is calculated is you have your assessed value, and when I say minus qualifying exemption, that's meaning you know, veterans get a discount, seniors, right? Uh, and then that's times multiplied by the property tax rate. So what we know is that Detroit has one of the, the highest property tax rates <coughs> in the state of Michigan, and one of the five highest property tax rates in the United States. So that second number, the property tax rate, is already high, right? But, but that's legal, that they did that, that that's, so now, what we are talking about, when I say unconstitutional assessments, that first number, the assessed value, is not supposed to be more than 50% of the property's value. And as Sonia so beautifully illustrated in her situation, you know, it was that her house was overvalued, and then she ends up with this huge tax bill that she can't pay, but a primary part of that is because the taxes they were charging her were not based on the true value of her home. Okay, you guys following me? So the, 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 the key is why is this happening? So there's all kinds of theories as to why this is happening. I'm a professor, so I, you know, I have to only uh, go with what I have evidence to prove. And the evidence suggests that what's really happening is, you know, is bureaucratic incapacity. So you look at this, between 20, in, 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 20, in 2008, look at that. These are home price, median home prices in Detroit. The home values in Detroit plummeted. They went down precipitously, quickly, deeply, right? And what happened, as, as the, as the uh, cartoon tried to illustrate, is that Detroit, the assessor, didn't make the change. But why did the assessor not make the change? A large reason why is because there was a report. The government did a report on the assessment office itself. It, um, the Auditor General. And what the Auditor General found is that the state of Michigan requires that per X number of parcels, you have to have X number of assessments. And, and the uh, Auditor General report says that Detroit had less than 50% of the amount of assessors that it was supposed to have. So they did not even have the resources to do the job that they were legally required to do because they were being underfunded. You understand what I'm saying? Under, understaffed. And so we have a situation where Detroiters are systematically paying more than they should in property tax. So now, uh, uh, if you guys are scared of numbers, I'm gonna lead you through this, but I do want you to see these numbers, but I'm gonna give you the, the, the summary. All right, so what I did in the, in the study we did is something called an assessment ratio study. And simply said, it's supposed to be assessed value divided by the sales price, right? And it's supposed to equal 0.5. Why? Because the Constitution says that people are not supposed to be taxed at more than 50% of the property's market value. So the number you're looking for, that I'm, and the, these numbers I'm about to show you, is 0.5. Anything above 0.5 is unconstitutional. Watch this. So let me just guide you through this. I know it's a lot, but look at this row I'm highlighting here. This is the percentage of properties in each of those years that were being unconstitutionally assessed. Look at in 2009. 65.5% of properties are being assessed in violation of the state constitution. All the way down, uh, you know, 2014, you had 83.2% of properties being assessed in violation of the state constitution. So the takeaway point from this is I need you to understand that this is what we're getting the number. That between 2009 and 2015, anywhere between 55 and 85 percent of homes in Detroit were being assessed in violation of the state constitution. Meaning that the property taxes that people were paying were illegally inflated. So people weren't buying purses, right? <laughs> supposed to be 0.5 as well. Now look at that, even look at 2009. That, two, that number is supposed, legally is supposed to be 0.5. 2.72 is 5.4 times the constitutional limit. That's the amount over. In 2010, it was 7.3 times the constitutional limit. Do you understand that this is severe unconstitutionality happening here in Detroit? So that's the first story. So these numbers, again, the, the, the point I want you to take away from this is 
between 55 and 85 percent of properties were being unconstitutionally assessed in Detroit. Now the second point breaks my heart the most. Because then as a researcher we wanted to know, all right, who is paying these taxes? So we broke the data up into what we call five quintiles, right? So the, the way, the best way to understand, so in quintile one, the average sale price is about $4,400, all the way up to the highest value quintile where the average sale price is about $76,600, you get it? So it's, it's trying to see when you break it up into blocks of you know, uh, uh, prices of homes, how do these unconstitutional assessments look? And look at this, my God. In quintile one and two, meaning homes valued at about less than $10,000, over 95% of those homes are being unconstitutionally assessed. Oh, so the very people who don't have the money to pay these inflated, illegally inflated property taxes, are the very same people who are being hit the hardest by these unconstitutional problems. Over 95% of people whose homes are valued less than $10,000 are being unconstitutionally assessed. But look at what breaks my heart the most. Look at the other side of the chart, quintile five. Homes worth about $76,000, look at that. Only about 16% of those homes are being unconstitutionally assessed. Okay, so, the, 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 so if none of these numbers make sense to you, all I want you to understand is that the burden of these unconstitutional assessments is being borne by the people who own the lowest valued homes, who are the people who are probably the poorest homeowners, the people who can least afford to be unconstitutionally assessed. So those numbers make no sense, understand what I just said, and you'll understand why my heart is broken by, by, by all of this. So what, what are we doing here? You know, when you come across, so you know, when you do a, so I did a study, I'm a professor, I'm a law professor, I, I'm a law professor from Chicago, but I'll be right here at Wayne State all of next year, so I'm moving to Detroit, Ooh. super excited. Yeah. Yeah. It's, we try to do some of it, this is crazy, right? I promise you, I, I do, um, my specialty is stolen land from people in the African diaspora. My last book was about stolen land in South Africa, I'm now working in Detroit, which Diaspora. Johannesburg is 80% black, Detroit is 80% black. Make sure to make these connections. I'm also working in Columbia with Afro descendants there. My specialty is about people stealing land from black folks. That it's not just Detroit where this is happening, right? And so, so what are we all trying to do? We're trying to put an end to this. It's foolishness. I mean, there's no other way. This is foolishness. It's just complete and total foolishness. <laughs> And so the first demand is to really just stop these unconscious things and stop, right? And so after we did the coalition did our research, and we, we figured the people who have the power to stop this is Alvin Horn, the chief uh, assessor, and Mike Dugan, uh, Dugan, who's the mayor. So the first request is we're saying, for those properties, those low-value properties, those properties where we know are being most deeply unconstitutional assessed, we're saying across the board, just give a 30% cut. Just 30% off, with cut, just cut. If you have a low just cut those assessments. Because what happened is this year, they actually did the long overdue reassessment of properties in Detroit. And things have gotten better, so I should be about that. That is a positive thing. The, the assessments used to be this far off, and now they're still off, but it's, it's smaller. But it's still significantly off for lower value homes. So we re-ran the numbers for this year, which is the first year they did the reassessment, and we found that homes valued at 18,000 $500 and below, are over 90% of those homes in that category are still being, uh, over 90% are still being unconstitutionally assessed. So that's why we're saying, even after the reassessment, the lowest value homes, again, the homeowners who could least afford these illegal assessments, are still being uh, unconstitutionally assessed. So the first demand is just across the board due to those cuts. We had a meeting, the coalition had a meeting with Alvin Horn uh, on, what was that, Mike? What was the Thursday. 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 Um, and so, well, you know, let me not get into that. Let me not sidetrack. The second request is uh, we want to remove the, um, because the Sister Monica was talking about, a property tax assessments is completely associated with water shutoffs because they're putting the water bills on, on your tax bill so that some people, even though they have the property tax exemption and don't have to pay taxes, you see them coming because they're about to get proposed upon, but it's for water. 
And they don't have to do that, and they need to stop doing that. They said they stopped doing it for homes, but we found evidence that that is uh, still going on in some cases. But we also know that they're, um, they're still doing it for churches. So you see churches in trouble now because they are still do, putting it on for, for the, on the water bill for nonprofits. So we want them just that all to stop. That's the first demand. The second is um, what we'll see to wonderfully talked about the property tax exemption is to make it more accessible, right? She really gave a wonderful presentation laying out, uh, what's his name? Mr. The, your client? Oh, Walter Hicks. Walter Hicks. We all heard that story of Walter Hicks and how difficult it was. They denied him. He didn't know why he got denied. You know, and so we're saying make it more accessible uh, and, and, and provide relief both forward looking and backward looking. We actually had a wonderful meeting with the Willie Donwell, the coalition on Thursday, and, uh, uh, and it looks like it looks like we're making some progress there, but we'll report back out on that. But that's our, our second demand. The next demand, uh, I mean, the, that's the second part of the first demand. The second demand is um, on these properties, we need to stop these properties that are about to be proposed on real soon. We need to stop that. Put a stop until we can make sure that. And we have evidence. I took my study to Alvin Horn. I said, before publishing this in the USC Law Review, um, we want to give you all a chance to respond to see if you have a problem with our numbers. He said, no, Bernie, it's all right. It was just a mess in Detroit, et cetera, et cetera. So they're not contesting the numbers. So the point is that what we need to do, I mean, we all know we're kind of in agreement that these are unconstitutional stuff, so let's not, let's stop these impending foreclosures. Who has the power to do that? Our, our man, Eric Sabri. Okay? And what Eric Sabri were asking him is three things. Number one, Stop all foreclosures until the coalition's three demands are met. Uh, and number two, just stop foreclosing on people for water bills altogether, because that was some foolishness in the first place. Yeah. And the last one we're asking is to stop foreclosing on people who owe less than $15,000. Because there's another thing happening in Detroit. If your house is worth $50,000 and you owe $6,000 in taxes, when they foreclose, you don't get the, 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 the remainder of the money. That, 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 for my math, 44,000, you, you, you know, they take the whole house for that 6,000. And so we want some number one to have, you should only be going through foreclosure for a significant amount of, of money owed, not for $500, not for one. Many of you in here are presently going through uh, tax foreclosure, and you know you've been you tried to get into the step forward program, and you know it's some nonsense. It's just a complete total nonsense. You know, extra rules. It's just it's, it's, it's actually laughable to the point where I talked to one of the step forward programmers. She was like, "These are the rules." You know, poor sister. She was just working. Dog it makes the rules. It's just a mess. Yeah. And so, Mister makes the rules. Thinking about revising that program and also. You know, these hardest hit funds that they're using for these corrupt demolitions going on in Detroit. Repurpose that money. So they are Now the third and final demand is many of so some of you are in the midst of being foreclosed on. And we want to put a stop to that. But what about the people who've already been foreclosed on in the world? You guys are part of this coalition. You guys are part of this fight. So we got to do something for you as well. And actually, that's what today is all about. The second half of this program is all about you all, right? So that's what the people's so that's what we're here to do. So after I shut my mouth, <laughs> we're about to all you guys, on your name tags, you received a, a, a room number. We're going to, we have eight different facilitators, eight different rooms. We're going to break up into eight rooms. So and what we're going to do in those rooms is basically talk about what needs to be done. For those people who already lost their home, what are some solutions? Because what the coalition didn't want to do is come on from on high and say, this is what we think needs to happen, right? What we need to do is put those people who've been dispossessed in the driver's seat and allow you all to determine what kinds of options, compensatory options you want, what kind of reparations you want for this. And so that's what we're doing today. That's why we have these small groups, because a lot of times in a big room like this, you know, some people are shy, some voices get overheard, some voices don't get heard. And so we're breaking up into eight rooms where we can record what you're saying, listen to what you're saying, hear your stories, and come up with some solutions. Based on what you all tell us today, we're going to aggregate that information, and that's what the coalition is going to fight for. We have two conversation starters. One potential thing we'll throw out there, and again, we'll see what happens in the conversation today, is the land bank owns from 32 to 
33,000 vacant residential properties. So, I mean, you got all these houses that were queued up because of the unconstitutional right. assessments, so right. they're going to give them back. Right, right, right. Or again, some of these houses they give you require so much work, people might not have the money to do the work necessary. Man. Some people just might want money. Right. And so, we're, but the point is that Detroit is broke. And so, we, if, if, it, if it comes from the Detroit's bank account, that means you all are going to have to pay for it. Yeah. So, it's like a double baby. Right. So, that can't happen. So again, use those hard to sit funds instead of doing it for these corrupt demolitions. Uh, if you didn't get a name, uh, um, if you didn't get a name, just come on up here now. 